so privileged to be able to read a poem today in tribute to our friend Bobby. And I thought about a number of poems that I could read um, today, but it's really hard to try and capture the man that he was and how good he was and what he meant to each and every one of us. So I just asked Teresa what was Bobby's uh, favourite poem, and she told me that they both loved this poem, so much so that there's a portrait painted by Teresa's niece Laura hanging in their living room. And this poem is called The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. So I want to pay tribute to Bobby and to Teresa by reading this poem today. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and I looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a say, some more ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you, Bobby, for taking the road rest less travelled. We will continue on your path. In the waters of baptism, Bobby died with Christ and rose with him in new life. May he share now with him eternal glory. to welcome all of you here today, Big Bobby's family and friends and comrades from all part of this island, gathered to remember with pride a great Republican and a great human being. On your behalf, I want to extend solidarity to Teresa, to Emmett and Bruna, to Fergal and Angelina, to Sean and Michelle, to Makina, to Maisie, Tyler, Che, Kane, Rory, Fionn, Fia, Luca, the twins Dylan and Dara, to Michael, Aaron and Alex, to Bob Moore's sister Geraldine and her husband Mark and family, her brother, his brothers Bran and Seamus, his uncle Jerry and his family, and to the extended Pickerings and Story families. Maradurt Pierce Ar Kriha Brista. August Tomwich Wake Foster Eganur Kierna, the Bob. Augustas Ogin Augustias Ogum Sigowell Cree Treza Brista Foster. Talan Dini Brunach and Sean Yumar Kanwij Ar Kara Ar Kionara Ar Gomrad Ar Shanaki Ar Rablojak Dan Scoth I want to thank the doctors and the nurses and the surgeons and the NHS staff who fought hard to save Bob. I want to thank all of the black and whites and his comrades here who organized today's funeral proceedings and the many, many friends who gathered in the story home, rallied round Teresa and the family, not just now, but during Bob's illness. I want to thank Father Gary 
for his kind words and Myra and Paul Rick and Sean and Raisha and Eamon and Grania, Bohanya and Kyol Galanta, a horse, Shiv, doing August Hamwich, Queer, Wake, Deepsha, Basta. There are others who could speak here today about Bobby. Those who soldiered with him, those who served long, hard time with him, those who helped build the peace with him, those who helped build Sinn Féin with him, or Jardine, or his beloved Teresa could speak here about Bobby, the man we all loved, and scores, perhaps hundreds, could tell of Bobby's many quiet, private acts of kindness. Jerry Kelly and Beck could tell the real story about the Great Escape. Marty or Podrick could correct many of Bob's tall tales. And outside of those small, tight circles of friends, there are many, many others among us who have their own big Bob story. I'm sure everybody who knew Bob has some little affectionate tale to tell. So I find it very daunting and very humbling and heartbreaking, but a great honour to speak here today. I also find it very unique and touching that many people have sympathised with me about Bobby's death and the same thing happened, I remember, with Martin McGuinness. And I've also found myself sympathising with Bobby's comrades and particularly with his very close friends. And I think that's a good thing. We've lost a crown taka. We've lost a crown lake. I've known many sound people, but Bobby was out on his own. He was always positive. He was a great motivator. One comrade told me one day that Bobby's story would make you think you could fly a plane. Nero in rod do janta aga. And when you talked to him, whatever the issue, you always came away knowing that he would move heaven and earth to do what was needed to be done to help. And he would do it with a smile. The crack around Bobby was, was mighty. He found it difficult to say words starting with an S. That would trigger his stammer. But he turned that into an advantage as well. How many times have we been at a meeting and we hear Bob saying, we need to, 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 to we need, we need, we need, we need to select, 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 fuck it. We need to pick a candidate. <laughs> and Terry Crossan, who's also a skilled stammerer. <laughs> Terry Crossan, a skilled stammerer, stammerer. Bobby could never have said that. <laughs> And Bobby's story once went to meet with the governor in Belfast prison one time. And it took them that long that he thought that the, the two of them were winding him up. And that ended up in another big row. But anyone who saw him manage the thousand people who turn up each year for the Belfast Cardio event will testify to his infectious humour. The way he poked fun at his stammer the way he slagged off me or Mary Lou or Michelle or Martin McGuinness or encouraged people to bid higher for an item in the auction. The way he scrounged items for the auction, especially from Richard McCauley, who was turned into a compulsive pilfer. I don't know anyone who knew Bobby's story who didn't like him, except for MI5, MI6, the old RUC, the British Army, and prison governors. And how could you not like him? He was smart, well-read, funny, caring, always ready to listen, always willing to help, always prepared to give freely of his time and his great positive energy. At Christmas, Big Bob was dotting an olive to many families in West Belfast. He did this quietly, privately, with no fuss. 
Money had no value for him personally. Far beyond that, ni lesh alas fein egarad kaji the dini ella. He was selfless in seeking to support others. The first 16 years of his life was spent in North Belfast. He was 13 when the Falls and the Clannard area and Ardoin were attacked by loyalist mobs led by the RUC and the B-Specials. Hundreds of homes were burnt out. Thousands became refugees in our own city. Bobby lived with his mother, Peggy, and father, Bobby, in the Marabone on the Old Park Road. They were forced out of their home. They went to live in another area in North Belfast. They were forced from that also. The British Army came onto the streets and quickly with the RUC, they turned on young nationalists. And this week, 50 years ago, three hugely significant events occurred which had a profound effect on the 14-year-old Bobby story. The Battle of St Matthews took place when Unionist gangs tried to destroy the Short Strand and Ballamacarrot, and the district was successfully defended by a small number of IRA volunteers and the local defence group. Tomorrow is July the 1st. On that day in 1970, the Unionist regime at Stormont passed the Criminal Justice Bill, which introduced a mandatory six-month prison sentence for rioting. Within six months, over 100 mostly young nationalists were imprisoned under mandatory sentences. And 50 years ago, this Friday, the Falls curfew began. Three and a half thousand British soldiers surrounded the Falls, killed four civilians, shrouded the area in clouds of CS gas. Hundreds were arrested and beaten, homes were smashed, mothers were denied food for their babies. And the curfew was broken after three days by the courage and determination of thousands of women led by Myra Drum and Marie Moore. And Bobby was politicised by all of this, by all these events around him. And the editorial in our local community newspaper, the Anderson's Town News, this week describes all of this extremely well, including how the Republican youth of Belfast rose up against the Orange, against the British state, and brought all of us to where we are today, particularly in this city of Belfast. Bobby has described his own experiences at the hands of the RUC and the British Army. He does it in a very understated way. I was arrested 20 times in a four-month period. They tied me up once and threw me out on the Shankill Road. They beat me at chapel one night. My experience was no different from many other people's experiences. The more beatings they gave me, the more my resolve developed. These were the things that brought me to be a Republican activist. Eventually, he got his way, and in the summer of 1972, he joined the Irish Republican Army. He was 16. In July that year, the British sent 30,000 troops into nationalist areas as part of Operation Motorman as an attempt to crush Free Belfast. Bobby described it. The armed struggle in the 1970s was flat out. We were all part of that. I was absolutely in the thick of it. We engaged the British Army on the streets. They came into our areas. They took over our local GA clubs and schools and turned them into British Army bases. It was a highly militarised situation. A year later, on his 17th birthday, he was interned. He spent two years in Long Cash. He once said that probably my most memorable night of internment was when we burnt Long Cash to the ground. In a little autograph book collected by Paul Wilson, a book of the autographs of former prisoners, Bobby's entry reads, Bobby's story, Interned, 1973, 
to 75, remand 76 to 77, remand 77 to 77, remand 78 to 79, remand 79 to 81, sentence 81 to 94, remand 96 to 98. And he wrote, a life of struggle is a life well lived. And he finished it with a wee smiley face at the bottom of it. Nineteen eighty one was the year of the hunger strike. The deaths of the comrades were for him the saddest moments, especially the hunger strikers. He described them as iconic figures. When it was required of them, they stepped into the breach. On the twentieth of August, the day that the last hunger striker, Mickey Devine, died. Big Bob was captured following a gun attack on British soldiers in Andersonstown. He was later sentenced to 18 years, and the 1983 escape came soon after that. Now, it wasn't all down to Big Bobby. It was a team effort. His job as OC on the day was to coordinate the escape. He always said the biggest contribution to making that day so successful was the comradeship. 38 Republican POWs, the biggest escape in British penal history. 19 got away, 19 were recaptured, including Bobby. He later said of that experience, I was captured within an hour of the escape and I was bought, brought to a punishment block and severely beaten. But I was enthused. My morale was sky high. You could not annoy me. Being captured could not undermine the euphoria I was feeling. I was lying naked and battered, but for me the most dominant thought that I had was if the escape was a success, it would absolutely devastate the British government. I wanted to ruin Margaret Thatcher's life. I wanted the British government damaged. So I think we can safely assume that Bob didn't like Maggie Thatcher. Anyone who attended the Great Escape Nights presented by Bobby Bick and Jerry Kelly will appreciate and applaud the great planning, the cooperation, and most of all, the courage and sheer audacity of that escape. They will also appreciate those nights as one of the best comedy shows you could ever hope to see. Bob was a natural storyteller, a shanaki like his mother. He was in the blocks when Sinn Féin stood candidates in elections in the north. The Rur Mara Thubbermwidge process Shikana Soganya, Taki Bobby Gomor Lin. And it wasn't all plain sailing for him in prison. On one occasion, he was put into a cell with Ned McGuire. Now, Ned McGuire is a gentleman, but he had a formidable reputation. He was big, he was strong, and he was very, very tough. Nobody messed with Ned. The screws were absolutely terrified of him. Big Bobby was terrified of spiders. And he was awakened the first night by a noise on the pipes and he thought it was a spider. And he sat bolt upright in the bed, but it was more dangerous than a spider. It was a mouse. So Bobby lay back in his bed, lay in wait with his shoe in hand, and when the mouse presented itself, whack. Down came the shoe. The mouse was no more. That woke Ned, who saw what happened. He growled at Bobby, you killed my mouse. <laughs> Bobby didn't sleep the rest of the night, and when the doors opened the next morning, Ned lifted Bobby's bed and belongings without a word and put them outside the cell. That was another narrow escape for Bob Moore. 
He was released in 94. He went straight back into the struggle. And the fact that it was moving into a different mode didn't faze him at all. He said, I put the same application into my current work as I did in the past. As Republicans, we're constantly making new sites of struggle, and we have to be alert and scientific in our approach. And during those years, he traveled widely, explaining the Republican strategy to comrades and to the wider Republican family. In 1996, he was arrested again, charged, spent two years on remand, and was eventually released in 1998. He was 44 years old, and he had spent more than 20 years in prison. Kuishe Kyun Chimarakt O Kyun Kindna Chira Egkanch Ogasegkor Dini Aranolos. He described his role. I spoke to many activists across the country, and I would have been a very keen exponent of the leadership's decision and decision making process. And what it comes down to is this many of us were very active in making sure that Republicans were informed about what was happening, so that we could pass the spin, so that people had confidence in where the strategy was going, so that, for example, people knew that the Good Friday Agreement was not a cutoff, that it provided a platform for the next level. Bobby became the chair of Belfast Sinn Féin and then of the Six County Cougar. He worked diligently at building the party, and the result of his work and the work of others can be seen in the strength of Sinn Féin today. Now, this weekend saw the election of Michal Martin as Taoiseach as part of the manoeuvre by Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, aided and abetted by the Greens, to maintain the status quo and to prevent Mary Lou MacDonald from becoming Taoiseach. They're entitled to do that, but their refusal to talk to the Sinn Féin leadership is a sad little undemocratic throwback to the way the Unionist leaders used to behave. Denying Sinn Féin voters their right to be included in talks shows how far the Dublin establishment is prepared to go to minimise and to delay the ongoing process of change across this island, including the movement towards Irish unity. So let me say it loud and let me say it clear. They will fail, just as the unionists failed in their exclusion policies. Be sure of this, change is coming, not least because of the work of change makers like Bob Moore. And in order to justify their policy of exclusion, and Taoiseach and Leo Varadkar say they cannot talk to us because Sinn Féin is controlled by shadowy figures like Bob. They also named Ted, Podrick, Marty. Sinn Féin is controlled by no one. We're an open, democratic, national movement with our elected leadership led by two fine women and other national leaders and countless regional and local leaders. And we're proud and we're glad that Bob and other former IRA volunteers are part of what we are. We're also proud of Bob and the others when they were IRA volunteers. They and their support base, our Republican family, our community, Republican Ireland defeated the British Army in this city and in this six counties, and they brought us and their political masters to the negotiating table. So Leo Varadkar has Michael Collins. Michal Martin has Davalura. We have Bobby's story. <laughs> and Bobby has done more for Irish freedom, peace and unity on this island than other Leo Varadkar or Michal Martin. During the mid-90s, Republican political prisoners were allowed to access pre-release schemes. And it was during 
some of these times that Bobby met and fell for the love of his life, Teresa. And Teresa had known Bobby a long time through his friendship with some of her family. And friends remember him telling her nervous he was when it came to meet her as part of the courtship. And he told her that while he would hug everyone else, he could only shake Teresa's hand. And one of the paroles took place at Christmas, and Teresa decided she would give Bobby something, so she took a large leg of turkey, wrapped it up in Christmas paper with a big bow on it, and gave it to him. And he was captured. But this time he was a willing lifer. She remembers another occasion when she was dancing with his brother Brian in the felons and noticed Bobby watching them. Bobby was a fly man in the love comics. When she asked him why he was watching Bran, he told her, I wasn't looking at Bran. I was looking at you. And when he went back to prison, Bobby wrote to Teresa in what she describes his careful, guarded letters in a deliberate way. And he knew the risks for family relationships of being a committed Republican activist. And he would tell her in his cautious way that he wasn't looking for a long-term relationship. And she's reminded him of that bit of stupidity every single week since then. He was, for Teresa, a lovely person, proud, kind, gentle, wise. And she was his beautiful Teresa, and he was more than happy to tell that to anyone willing to listen. As well as being an accomplished revolutionary, Bobby was also a singer. Not many people know that. But like myself, he was blessed with the gift of a golden voice. <laughs> On one Valentine's night, some of Belfast's wrinkly Republican Romeos and their partners stepped off in Madden's and there was a diddly D session going on. And then Teresa noticed that Bobby was sitting on a high stool with a guitar in his hand, and she was mortified. Bobby couldn't play a guitar. So he asked for hush, and he said he was going to sing a song to his beautiful Teresa, and then he delivered a wonderful rendition of Neil Young's Unknown Legend. And a few months ago in their living room, he repeated that for Teresa. I did the backing vocals. She used to work in a diner. Never saw a woman look finer. I used to order just to watch her float across the floor. So for the unknown legend, Teresa of Bulabus, the Cree, the... All of us who loved Big Bobby were shocked by his illness. It was hugely debilitating, especially in recent months. But he never gave in to it. He never stopped working. Just before Christmas, oxygen tank, tank over his shoulder, he was there for the opening of the new Republican book and craft shop on the Falls Road. Bobby and Sinead Welch were the driving force behind its redesign. And during the lockdown, he still kept in touch with comrades and friends. He was on the phone to our house the day before his operation, winding up flat and telling tales. And throughout his illness, he kept thinking, planning, designing, zooming, talking, and all the time working to strengthen Sinn Féin and to advance our struggle. And rarely a word of complaint. Always mindful not to impose on others, especially Teresa and the family. And he approached his illness and the operation the same way he did all the challenges of his life. Positively, determined, refusing to lie down, and with no sense of pity. He was looking to a future in which he and Teresa would again walk Ballyhorn and Beach. And sadly, it wasn't to be. Bobby was one of the bravest people I've ever had the honor to know. He was part of an amazing group of people who over recent decades have formed a cohesive, effective, collective leadership. During his time as chairperson in Belfast and across the North, we have grown significantly in electoral strength 
and representation. And Bobby had a, a special attraction and a special way of working with younger people. He believed in young people. He always gave them the respect due to them. He was a, a born diplomat, a positive influence, a uniter, a skilled organizer, and one of our great leaders. His death is a huge political blow, but more importantly, I suppose, at a very personal level, a deep loss for all of us who knew him. And there have been many tears shed since the news of his death. There is a void in our lives. There is an emptiness. There is an absence, a silence. But Bobby wouldn't want that. He would want us to mind each other. He would want us to continue our struggle and to win that struggle. So on my own behalf, on behalf of Clet and our family, I want to extend sincere and deepest sympathies and solidarity to Teresa and to her family. We all miss Bob, his wisdom, his analysis, his crack in the time ahead. We have an expression in Irish, Kran Taka, to describe a mainstay, a tree, a main support tree. That was Bob. It's very hard to believe that he's gone. And there's always a terrible shock when a crown taka falls. The shock does stop us all in our tracks. And we do retreat into ourselves. But the sun still shines and the rain still falls. But at the same time, something very profound occurs as we try to come to terms with what has happened. And we may never be the same again, even when our griefing gives way to acceptance whenever or if ever that happens. But be sure of this, because of Bobby and others like him, we are who we are, and we are what we are. And because of him, we will be even better as human beings, as Irish patriots, as Republicans, as comrades, as change makers, as United Irelanders. He brought out the best in all of us. And because of him, we can go forward with optimism as more and more people in this island realize that England rules us only in English interests and that the time is coming when we will end English rule and replace it with governance by the people of this island for the people of this island. We don't need Boris Johnson or his cronies or any of the other mediocre amadons and non-entities who are arrogant enough to think that they can rule us. They cannot rule us. They have not our consent to rule us. <laughs> That's what Bobby believed. And as Ian Paisley said to Martin McGuinness one time, we don't need Englishmen. To rule us. So, thank you, Bob. And for the rest of us, if we're already activists, it's time to be more active. And if we're not activists, this is the day that we should start. Gurumila my Ogot Bob Akri. Libe the Lahad Arish on. Slan Kara Slan Bob Moore. Gurumila Magab Gulyar. Re 
Well, Tomid on Sulakale and York is Tomid Krivrishta. We're here, we're broken hearted, saying a farewell to our leader, a Republican icon, a Republican hero, a man of principle, a man of action, a great, great Belfast Republican, a great Irish Republican, Bobby Story. And today is a testament to how much he achieved in his life and how much he was loved. Thousands of people have come along this afternoon to pay their respects to who, someone who is an absolute champion, who touched all of our hearts, who made a difference to each and every one of our lives. People were represented here from right across this island and it's the tribute that Bobby Story deserves because he was such a great person. He was a champion of champions and we will never ever forget the likes of him. Bobby has made, made such a difference to each and every one of our lives and we're very grateful for that. But our hearts are broke today as we lay to rest another Republican hero.